Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Independent Sage Briefing. Now, in recent weeks, the number of COVID-related deaths in England and Wales has been on the rise again. 960 deaths registered during the week ending 8th of April. And pressures on the NHS continue to worsen. And the figures for long COVID keep rising. And that's why long COVID is the subject of our discussion today. First, though, I have to give a massive thank you to all the 270 viewers of Indie Sage who contributed to our crowdfunder, which we closed after only three days, and we've raised over £20,000. We're incredibly grateful to all of you. The funds will support the citizens' backroom staff to maintain this service in the coming year. Why? Because the pandemic is not over. New variants are emerging, long COVID and NHS pressures will remain. Now, after our data presentation today, Danny Altman, professor from Imperial, will lead a discussion on long COVID with two experts, Paula Longelli, a professor of health economics, and Andre Sequeira, professor of infectious diseases from Brazil. They'll focus on cost and quality of life of long COVID sufferers, because this is a mass disability event. Now, secondly, before we go to the data, I'm delighted to announce that we've got uh, several new members of Independent Sage joining us today to expand our pool of expertise. They are Sheena Cruikshank, an immunologist and professor in biomedical science at the University of Manchester. Trish Greenhow, who many of you know, professor of primary health, primary health care sciences at the University of Oxford. Dr. Benita Kane, who's been on before, consultant respiratory physician in Manchester. And finally, the brilliant Dr. Deepti Gurdasani. She's a clinical epidemiologist and senior lecturer in machine learning at Queen Mary University, who has, alongside our own Professor Christina Pargel, been one of the most prominent analysts of the pandemic in the media and social media. And alongside all of my female colleagues. They've suffered a lot of uh, trolling and abuse, but they've done an amazing job. So Deepti is going to present the latest COVID numbers and trends today. So over to you, Deepti. Thanks, Anthony. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so that I can go through the numbers. Here we go. Okay, hopefully it's visible to everyone. Um, so first, I'm just going to start with where we are with cases. As we know that, you know, the confirmed case reports are not reliable anymore. So looking at the Office for National Statistics prevalence estimates, it looks like um, positivity has peaked in all nations, but prevalence is still extremely high. So one in 17 people in the community infected in England with Overall in the UK, about 3.7 million people testing positive in the week ending 16th of April. If we look at the prevalence by age, what we see is that the prevalence is currently highest in people who are 70 years and above, which is obviously problematic because this is the age group that we associate with, is vulnerable to more severe outcomes. And if we look at uh, this Office for National Statistics report today that looks at the cumulative prevalence of COVID, so exposure to infection over time, um, what we find is, and this doesn't include the first wave, what we find is that this differs across nations, but about 71% of people in England have been exposed, have been infected uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Of course, the actual number is likely higher uh, if we include the first wave as well. A lot of this exposure has actually happened since Freedom Day, that's last July. Um, and while the impact on severe disease has been blunted by vaccines, clearly, you know, we have seen mass exposure, which will affect long COVID statistics. And what we see is Wales and Scotland, which perhaps adopted a more cautious approach, have had a lower cumulative prevalence of infection. Looking at hospitalizations, it looks like overall in the UK, hospitalizations have peaked. Uh, this is hospitalizations with COVID-19 and at a similar level to the BA1 Omicron wave. If we look at it by nations, again, hospitalizations are reducing in all nations. 40% um, of those in hospital had COVID-19 as a primary cause. That doesn't mean that other patients did not have COVID contributing to their hospitalization. Worryingly, about 23% of those in hospital had 
COVID diagnosed after seven days of admission, which means it was likely hospital acquired. And this is quite a worrying trend. If we look at other nations more carefully, it looks like hospitalizations have plateaued or are reducing across all nations now. But what does this mean for the NHS? If we look at the NHS, and this is looking at ambulance response time, so emergency services, we find pressures are unprecedented. So clearly response times have increased more so for the less urgent uh, calls. But even if we look at the most urgent calls, what we find is that the average response time is higher than the target, which obviously puts people at risk. And if we look at emergency services, so in a &E, the uh, time taken from um, uh, people coming into a &E to decision to, uh, from decision to admit to hospital admission, if you look at delays for four hours, 27% of people now have four hour delays, 4% have delays for 12 hours or more. Um, and you can see that these delays are pretty much the highest that we've seen um, in over a decade. Um, so moving on to emergency from uh, emergency care to routine care, if we look at people being referred for non-emergency care, waiting for treatment, about 37% of people are now waiting 18 weeks or more for uh, to see their consultant. And this is the highest since um, the peak of the wave in uh, the first wave in March 2020. And if we look at the people waiting for diagnostic tests, again, we have the highest number ever since recording started, uh, 1.5 million people waiting for these. So very high pressures on the NHS. Uh, and we're hearing this from the frontline as well. There are many, many warnings about the severe pressures on the NHS, but unfortunately, because of the lack of support, the response to this has been that, you know, COVID testing is being stopped in some NHS trusts and in other trusts, COVID wards are being shut down so that people with COVID will now mix with people without COVID, which unfortunately will likely worsen the issue given the hospital acquired infection rates that we're already seeing. Looking at deaths, um, what we see is um, that deaths have been rising, both as for the Office for National Statistics and the, the, the 28 day death um, uh, statistics. It's unclear whether this has peaked or not because recent data will be underestimated because of data lags. But if we look at when we had reliable data available, we were still seeing more than 1000 deaths per week. And that is with COVID on the death certificate. Overall, in total, we've had more than 190,000 deaths from COVID. So that's with COVID on the death certificate and more than 15,000 in this year alone during the Omicron wave. In terms of vaccination, uh, we're in a similar place as we were before, about 60% of our population is boosted. One in five people are still completely unvaccinated with the vast majority of these being children. Uh, the spring um, boosting program has been moving forward and now more than 40% of people about 75 have re received their fourth dose or uh, second booster, which will hopefully blunt the impact of the high prevalence we're currently seeing in this age group. In terms of variants, there's a worrying global picture emerging where we're seeing multiple sublineages of Omicron emerge, uh, which are showing a higher level of fitness than the BA2 lineage and corresponding growth of cases as well. Um, what we're seeing is what we call convergent evolution. So we're seeing different sublineages of Omicron develop particular mutations and positions similar to the Delta variant and showing growth in different regions across the world. Uh, so this is just to highlight that, you know, the pandemic hasn't ended and virus evolution hasn't ended either. And we will likely see newer sublineages replace um, previous sublineages as time goes on with surges unless there are, uh, you know, measures put in place. Thankfully, in the UK so far, the lineages that are growing in other regions, we only have very few cases of, but it's something worth keeping an eye on because, of course, with the amount of travel that we have, we will likely see um, new sublineages emerge. So moving on to long COVID, which is the topic for discussion today, uh, this is from the Office for National Statistics Estimates of Persistent Long COVID, and this is for infections 
up to February. So it doesn't include infection in February. So the full impact of Omicron hasn't been felt here yet. And uh, it's estimated that about 1.7 million people have had persistent symptoms for four weeks or more. That's one in 37 people in the general population. Uh, this is not trivial for many people. So for 780,000 people, they've had persistent symptoms for more than one year. And 1.1 million of these report negative impact on their day-to-day -day activities. Um, and people keep asking about whether Omicron causes long COVID. It does appear so because the about 330,000 of these cases of long COVID are attributed to the Omicron wave. And like I said, the full impact hasn't been felt yet. Um, what we've seen during the Omicron wave is increases across all age groups. And again, this is before February, which means that we're seeing increases even in the highly vaccinated age groups. Um, and that is probably attributable to the sheer rate of infection we've seen during the Omicron wave. We're seeing particular increases in children with increases about fourfold since July last year, which may be related to this being a largely unvaccinated group and having uh, had mass exposures throughout the Omicron wave. When we look at the occupational risk of long COVID, it's very clear that some occupations are at high risk. So health and social care, teaching and education show increases throughout and show the highest prevalence of long COVID. And predictably, this is having impact on uh, businesses and employers where, absent, uh, where absences due to long COVID are quite high. And like all impacts of COVID, the impact of long COVID is also unequal with the impact, uh, with the prevalence of long COVID being highest in more deprived groups. Um, this is um, data from the REACT study that just shows how symptoms tend to change over time. And essentially what this shows is that if there is a decline in the num proportion of people who have long COVID between four weeks and 12 weeks. But if you have persistent symptoms at 12 weeks, unfortunately, you're likely to have persistent symptoms long term. So at least up to six months and potentially even longer. So for many people, this is sadly a long term illness that doesn't resolve quickly. Um, well, thankfully, um, this is a UK HSA review that came out pre Omicron. So we don't know very much about this with Omicron. But that one did show that those people who are vaccinated tend to have lower prevalence, lower severity of long COVID. Uh, how this works with Omicron is unclear, but what's clear is that this protection is unlikely to be complete. And if we allow high level of infection, there's going to be enough breakthrough to have enough impact at population level. So moving on to the care that people are getting for long COVID. So this is referrals for long COVID with post COVID assessment. And, you know, we're seeing a steady rate of referrals since August last year, about 4,000, 5,000 a month. Totally about um, 43,000, uh, 44,000 referrals have been accepted, but this is much, much lower than the current estimates for long COVID, even in adults. Um, so it doesn't seem like the need that we can see through estimates is being met and only 37,000 post-COVID assessments have been completed. And if you look at the time this takes, at the waiting time for assessment, about a third of people are waiting for more than 14 weeks currently for assessment. And uh, you know, while we talk about long COVID, there is also a problem of post-acute sequelae, which are not exactly long COVID, but you know, SARS-CoV-2, even in its mildest form, is associated with neurodegeneration, neurocognitive, changes, neuropsychiatric disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, and kidney disease. So there's more and more evidence accumulating that even at one year, you can see these impacts on people who had mild infection. So in summary, uh, cases, hospitalizations are now declining in all nations, but cases are still very high and they're highest in the older age groups. Um, there, there's been a very high level of population exposure since last year, despite early vaccine rollout, which has unfortunately translated into higher rates of long COVID. Significant numbers of hospitalizations are still being seen, but uh, worryingly, we are seeing a lot of COVID acquired in hospital as well. And deaths are still occurring in significant numbers, although we don't know the trend yet, and this will become clearer next week. In terms of the NHS, the impact is cumulative and we're seeing unprecedented pressure that we've seen on emergency and routine care in over a decade. Unfortunately, what this will lead to is poor infection control, which will very likely worsen these pressures. 
The long COVID numbers that we are seeing are very high and reflect this mass exposure to infection. And this is before the impact of Omicron has been felt fully. We are seeing clear correlation with occupational risk given that this is most common in, in people of the working age group, and this will very likely have significant long-term impact on both health and economy. Referrals for long COVID are happening, but seem very low compared to what we think the need is, with long waits for many people. Uh, I'm going to end there and now hand back to Anthony. Deepti, thank you very much for uh, brilliant figures, rather depressing actually, uh, particularly on the long COVID front. And that's our focus now. We, we've got many questions from the public on this incredibly important issue. But to start with, uh, Professor Danny Altman is going to introduce our two guests and they'll discuss the policy and socioeconomic issues first. So over to you, Danny. Thanks a lot. So, so from the beginning, um, Independence Stage has hosted discussions on different aspects of, of long COVID, um, including a recent one on long COVID in children. Um, and, you know, as you just heard, it's a topic which isn't going any place anytime soon, so we'll continue to look at it. Um, today, our starting point is a little bit different. It's an aspect that's received even less attention than the rest because we wanted to try and look at what the future holds in terms of the impact of having so many people with a whole new set of disabilities, um, perhaps 1.7 million in the UK, um, at least 50 million worldwide in terms of things like healthcare planning and provision, employment, employment law, and how we open up that dialogue with, with policymakers. So we've got two experts for you to open up that discussion. Um, we've got um, Professor Paula Logelli, who's chair in health economics at University of Auckland, and until recently was at University College London. And she's the lead on a work package in the NIHR Stimulate ICP study that look, that's looking at the costs and outcomes of long COVID clinics in England. Um, and the trial element of Stimulate ICP is looking at new interventions and the cost effectiveness of those. And we've also got um, Andre Seguera, who comes to us as Professor of Infectious Disease, is sitting in Rio in Brazil today, where he heads a national cohort study on COVID-19 called Rebra COVID, but also has um, a long track record on policy interactions in relation to resource for chronic disease as head of the Replic multi-center study on the natural history of chikungunya infection. So we're gonna go, I think, first to Paula to um, say a few words to open this aspect of the discussion. Great, thanks very much, Danny. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I think actually economics has been a bit of a dearth in the conversation about COVID and long COVID. So I'm pleased to make a contribution in that space. Uh, so I wanted to put into context what my research in long COVID space uh, involves. And as a health economist, I'm in quite a, a unique position and also quite a challenging place. And then I get to study this brand new disease, um, which is the kind of uniqueness of it and it makes it exciting, at least from a research perspective. Uh, but part of the challenge is just both the enormity of the number of individuals who are infected and also the urgency of this, the need for this evidence. Um, and we need to make sure that we're managing um, a long COVID in an equitable um, and efficient uh, way. And we're doing this as we're coming out of a pandemic period. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a perfect storm in some way. Um, so we're treating a new disease. There are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of uncertainties. Um, we don't know who will get long COVID. Um, we don't know how long it will last. We don't know how they're going to present, what they're going to present with. And we don't know what the treatments are. Um, and so we're trying to care and cure for this um, um, disease. And what we just saw from that presentation, an incredibly stretched healthcare workforce um, with what is also strained healthcare budgets. So in terms of the Stimulate ICP um, study, I'm leading on one of the work packages, which is actually trying to understand what long COVID clinics um, in England are currently doing. So there's nearly 90 um, long COVID clinics that have been funded. They're following nice guidelines, but they can do so in a, in a different variety of ways. So the patient pathways are very different. Um, and one element we'll do is actually to undertake an estimation of how much it costs to deliver long COVID care 
And of course, the delivery of how much it costs to deliver it will largely be different from how much they're funded to deliver it because they just had to have a stab in the dark about you know, how much funding to give to these different clinics. So we're hoping to inform that. Um, and of course, that's just one part of the picture. And I'm sure many um, of the um, long COVID sufferers watching um, will agree that uh, what's really important for them is actually the effect on their lives. So the effect on their productivity um, and the effect on their employment. Uh, and so whether they can work and, and to what level of intensity. And so we're also going to collect data within that study that um, at the patient level using a range of validated questionnaires, although then they're, they're not validated in the long COVID space because it's a new disease. So we'll ask questions about their um, employment, their productivity. We'll also ask questions about their um, quality of life. So their anxiety, um, their level of cognition, things like breathlessness. And that will allow us to understand the burden of disease. Uh, so both the clinical burden, um, the quality of life burden, and also the financial burden. And acknowledging that that financial burden is to the health system, um, the sufferers, and also to the economy. Um, and it's kind of like akin to, I guess, a developing a patient registry. And there are a number of patient registries already for established chronic conditions. Um, and they're really key for informing kind of uh, um, research treatment policy. Um, and it gives us this kind of big picture that I don't think we see in that kind of socioeconomic space. Obviously, though, um, Simula SAP is a research project, so it has an end date. Um, and what we're really keen um, to do, and what I'd be really keen to do, would be to that somebody takes up the kind of mantle that we're um, uh, developing in terms of the number of questionnaires, the number of instruments, and starts routinely collecting this information um, in the um, healthcare system. And therefore, we can be proactive. We've been had a period of very reactionary policies, and hopefully, we can be proactive. We'll have data that's been collected. Um, and then we'll be able to do some stuff on kind of disability provision, uh, workforce planning, employment policies, um, and kind of be opportunistic in that way. So that's just a little bit of introduction, Danny. I hope that was useful to the Stimulate project. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. So we'll come back to you with questions in a moment. But first, let's go to Andre, because, um, you know, one of the big problems in this is that we are in uncharted territory and we don't know what the future holds and how long for and what kind of interactions it involves. Um, but Andre has kind of been there before because we always mention the sort of precedent of um, um, persistent um, disease after chikungunya infection in Brazil and how they've had to grapple with that. And Andre has been doing quite a lot of the grappling. So let's um, go to him now to, to hear about his experience. Um, Andre, do you want me to show slides or do you want to show them? Yes, please, Danny. Uh, I can try. I have restrictions. So, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a great discussion and, and a great initiative to to have this independent stage and something we, we surely could use in Brazil. So, as Danny mentioned, uh, uh, we we had this experience, although less, uh, we also have a lot of more questions than answers regarding chikungunya, which shares these post-acute uh, characteristics. So next, Danny, please. Uh, so chikungunya is a vector-borne disease, an alpha virus, uh, and it, it's, it's transmitted throughout the tropics. Uh, and its main characteristics is causes fever, acute febrile illness, but also more characteristically a joint pain and arthritis, uh, which can last for, for several months or even years. Uh, next, then, please. Uh, so, so we don't have a certain uh, measurement of the global impact of chikungunya. Uh, we estimate that around 40 to 50% of infected individuals present with chronic arthralgia uh, for longer than one year. Uh, there's a large variation in estimates and lack of comparability in studies of prevalence or instance of, of, of this persistence. Um, and we, as we, we dig deeper on, on the manifestations of disease, we, we see that it's a complex spectrum of manifestations, not a single phenotype. So we can see patients with uh, clear inflammation, arthritis, more sort of a mechanical type of, of 
of pain, which seems to be the majority, but also neuropathic uh, uh, conditions, and also multiple affected systems. So there are a lot of skin-related stations of alopecia, uh, a worsening of diabetes, of onset of diabetes, and other metabolic diseases as well. Next, then, please. Uh, and one of Sorry. the diff okay. Well, one one thing we we observe in, in patients with chikungunya is that they have this cycle of they they begin with pain, it leads to stiffness of the joints, a handicap in daily life. They stop the physical activities that leads to deconditioning and and worsening of the stiffening. Uh, it can lead to weight change, self depreciation because people are not working, doing what they are used to do, uh, limitation in social life, something that has been also seen in, in, in COVID, depression and worsening of the pain. So it's a very difficult cycle to intervene at. We have to intervene at different points in different uh, systems as well. Next, uh, Danny. And as we, uh, one of the things we are studying is trying to, to apply a, a comprehensive set of, of evaluation so uh, although most most of the of the focus is on pain we also measure there's a lot of impact on fatigue sadness handicap in daily life social consequences and economical as well quality of life sexual life some and sometimes one thing that affects a lot of, of patients with chikungunya is there is not a clear um uh, sign of disease that's not uh, always picked at, at uh, diagnostic tests or radiology. So there's a lot of, of distress from family members or even health professionals on if people are only being lazy or if they all actually have something. That's something we see a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome as well. Next. Uh, so the reality of chikungunya outbreak from public health perspective, it's a disease that has a very high attack rate, well, not as high as COVID, but that when there is an outbreak in the city, we see the whole neighborhood or, or, or large stretches of large cities involved. So that's, there is this uh, high number of people who are, are infected uh, right away. Next, then it, that's through the epidemic period, and then we will have a proportion of patients who remain symptomatic, musculoskeletal disorder, with or without polyarthritis uh, throughout the following weeks, months, and even years. Uh, proportion, of lower proportion, have chronic inflammatory rheumatisms uh, and the patients who, who recover as well. Next. Uh, in this, this period, we have to try to lead from a society and also have system perspective on the suffering, uh, financial aspects, the handicap on, on daily life, sometimes people in, in, with young age that have to suffer that very similarly to COVID as well. Next, then. Next, please. Uh, we don't have many uh, estimates of, of, uh, of published ones on the impact, economical impact. Uh, this is a study from, from Rio New Island. We are replicating that in Brazil currently, but we don't have the, the estimates yet. Uh, and it leads to, to uh, these estimates of 90 euros per case, 2,000 uh, euros per case in, in hostels. So there's a lot of direct costs to the health system, but also direct costs to individuals who... who who are not exerting their, their, their financial activities anymore. And a lot of impact if people have to purchase uh, drugs, in the, in the main case, painkillers, and there's a lot of over-the-count, uh, less non-regulated drugs that people start taking that lead to, to, to worsening of other health conditions as well. Next. So there's a lot of, of some similarities with chikungunya and COVID. There's acute infection with uncertain leaks of risk of long-term consequences, trying to estimate chronicity and then impact on, on people's lives. 
uh, the, the, the distinctive and variable pathophysiological manifestations and distinct disease phenotypes we've seen. Uh, we don't have any clear specific therapeutics for chronic manifestations of, of these diseases or what can be done and, and what's the effectiveness of these interventions. So we don't have clinical trials to, to, to inform policy. Uh, the, the, the multitude of, of manifestations, there's the need of transdisciplinary approach and better estimates of costs and how better healthcare models could improve uh, individuals' lives. And for the individuals, the feeling of lack of support, of understanding from family, work, friends, government, health professionals, etc. Um, next, Danny. Yeah, this is the group that is studying. We have the, this very fruitful collaboration through Danny as well. Uh, and we hope to have this is both um, um, chikungunya, and we have replicated that to COVID, to the rubber COVID study and trying to, to, to reach similar understanding on, on what we can, what works and what can be done better for that. And that's it. Thank you. Danny, I have Thanks, to Andre. discuss it. Thanks, both of you. It's terrific. So I, I know Anthony's got a lot of questions from the public, so I won't hold the full floor. And um, can I ask each of you maybe just, just, just briefly, is, is, is there anywhere in the world that we can look for kind of best practice on how to engage in the, in the, in the kind of, um, you know, treatment course that we're looking for here in long COVID? Is, is anywhere having these discussions and having them well? I actually think that the UK is leading in this space. Um, and, and I did my uh, usual of, so the, the US obviously has more long COVID because they had more COVID. And I thought maybe they were, um, maybe some of their insurers, so the Kaiser, Permanen Kaiser Permanente, I looked, uh, looked up and they don't have long COVID care in that same way that we have our, our funded long COVID clinics in England. Um, so we possibly are leading the charge here in, in the UK, um, which is useful because we also have a large number of long COVID uh, sufferers. And uh, Andre, can you say anything about, I know you've got a long history of um, discussions with policymakers. Um, give us the flavour of how that works. And does it work? <laughs> I wish it worked. I don't, we, we haven't been very successful. On this uh, and uh, what, what we, we we have a lot of difficulty on the on the chikungunya side uh, uh, of discussions on convincing people to invest in that because there's a lot of, of attention for the acute phase of these epidemics and how to to manage that. But once this initial wave passes there's not a lot of attention. So that's something that has not been established and it depends a lot from city to city. And that's something we have been suffering in Brazil, particularly with COVID because of the lack of, of leadership from the national government. So each city, each state has a different approach and it's, it's non-harmonized, although there is some initiatives trying to, to measure that. Uh, we, we suffer with lack uh, of information and, and clear data and harmonization. So we look forward to, to, to what you, you can contribute as well in trying to, to make parallels here. Super. So I should hand back to Anthony to chair all the other questions and Benita and things. Yeah. Thank you. Can, actually, can I ask a quick question to Andre? Because... Those that don't know, chikungunya virus is related to Zika virus, to dengue virus, and to yellow fever. Are you seeing, Andre, any of these longer term sequelae like you're seeing with COVID and chikungunya in dengue or Zika virus? Because they spread very rapidly through mosquitoes. Uh, for dengue, we do have some minor... Uh... Uh, reports on, on chronic fatigue syndrome post dengue virus, but it's not well 
characterized and measured. Uh, we, we are trying to do that now with the same uh, cohort, the same multi-center approach. Uh, and with Zika, what we, we, we have experienced at is on, on the, the, the consequences for, for pregnant women and their, sure. their offspring. So uh, we have recently trying to, we haven't been having uh, transmission for the last three or four years, but there is a large burden to this mothers a lot of them now are single mothers because the the fathers are not together anymore and they are their children with a lot of, of needs in terms of, of of their cognitive and also uh multiple uh sequelae that they have from the microcephaly thank you very much uh benita did you have a very quick yeah, I, I did. Thank you, Anthony. I, it's really wonderful to hear Paula talking about some proper research into the health economic impacts uh, of long COVID. I, I fear that we're really only just scratching the surface because when you look at the care that the long COVID clinics are offering, that is only one part of the total burden of disease and illness. So they will then refer patients on for cardiology investigations, rheumatology investigations. They can often go around multiple different specialties seeing different people. And I think when you look at the impact on those 1.7 million people, the three quarters of a million who've had symptoms for more than a year, their inability to work, they've got caring responsibilities, particularly uh, people who've got children with long COVID having to give up work. Um, you've got people on reduced hours and the burden to the economy of providing that healthcare for chronic illness, sickness, plus the wider economic um, losses is going to be astronomical. And I know that the UK government has put 50 million in, but I think that pales into insignificance when you look at this as a rising burden. So it's brilliant that we're scratching the surface, but I do think we've got a long way to go to really understand the full impact of long COVID. Thanks very much, Benita. Look, we do stay with us, uh, Paula, if you can, and uh, Andre, but um, we're going to go to the questions now because we've got several. And I'm going to kick off with the first question is from Colin Morgan. Colin, would you like to ask your question? <clears throat> Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Yep. Hello there. Um, considering the advice that might be offered to reduce the incidence of long COVID um, from the continuing high numbers, um, is there any evidence that exertion while infected with COVID leads to a higher likelihood of developing long COVID. Or on the other, the other way of looking at it, is there any evidence that properly resting during infection reduces likelihood of developing long COVID? And is anybody actually looking at this, please? Thank you very much. That's an incredibly uh, good question because, you know, uh, should you rest in flu? Should we be staying off work, not for just three or four days, but for kind of two weeks or something? That's a really important question because it could have a big influence. So Deepti, I'm going to come to first and maybe Sheena has a thought on this as well. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there are several studies now that show that there's a correlation between rest and recovery from COVID. We don't know if it's a causal relationship, by which I mean, we don't know if it's the rest that's actually leading to better recovery or if it's another marker of somebody who's able to rest, you know, whether they have better access to healthcare, whether they're socioeconomically in a more privileged position. But certainly we do see correlations in studies, associations between rest and recovery. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to say whether <laughs> it's causal, but I would say, yes, I mean, if you are suffering from long COVID, as with other diseases, do try and rest if you can. But unfortunately, not many people have that privilege given there is very little support for this disease, including financial support by government for people who are suffering. Thanks, Deputy Sheena. Yeah, and in terms of immune function, there's certainly evidence about how exercise can affect immune function. So it's been shown that um, moderate exercise tends to be quite positive for immune function and actually overall would decrease your risk of um, respiratory tract infections, whereas um, kind of chronic exercise, kind of you know, marathon runners, that type of thing, um, it's quite detrimental for your um, immune function. 
So you can imagine that your immune response requires a lot of energy. It's, it's taking a lot of resources from you. So if you're further depleting them by trying to kind of overdo things, you can imagine that there will be a cost benefit to how well your immune system is going to be able to cope with things. So I, I guess, you know, there, there could be a little bit of science to back up the, these kind of observations that Deep T is, is discussing. OK, thank you. I don't see any other. So we've got several questions. So I'm going to move on to the next one. And um, all, all of the rest actually have been sent in to us. So I'm going to read them out. The first is from Louise Alban. She says, is there a distinction or difference between symptoms and damage from acute COVID, which may take months to resolve, and the syndrome of long COVID, which can arise without any serious acute symptoms, and even after a period of apparent recovery. How, when, and should we distinguish them? And she also adds, is microclotting involved in both of these? So I'm gonna to come to Danny first on that one. Yeah, I'm happy to have the first go at that. So, so the, you know, the simple answer, I think it's just the obvious, isn't it? That we're in very early days for for the cutting and slicing of long COVID in terms of system in terms of um, clusters. Um, so you know, there's some indications. So um, one of the biggest studies so far is the FOSP COVID study, which is post hospitalised COVID, which obviously is a very severe subset because it was very hard to get hospitalised. You have to be extremely ill, and some of the symptom clusters in those look slightly different um, to, to some of the others. Um, but the simple answer is, I think that we're kind of really in the dark ages still for understanding the nuances of, of long COVID. And I wouldn't try and distinguish between the kind of person who's got findings on their brain imaging versus their cardiac imaging um, versus skin blisters at the moment. So I just don't know enough. But um, Benita looks like she wants to say something as well. No, no. No, sorry. I was, I was still, I was just messaging Colin <laughs> about the last question. Sorry. Sheena, do you have anything to add to this? I mean, one of the, the things that we are picking up is we are picking up increasingly changes in immune profiles in patients who've got symptoms beyond four weeks. And, and increasingly, it's looking like there are some abnormalities um, that persist in people who have some of these sequelae that kind of linger on or, or who have long COVID. Now, I don't know that these, these changes are subtle enough that we can tease apart the two conditions, as Danny says, yet. But there are definitely immune changes, and hopefully these are going to start informing how maybe we can better diagnose the conditions, but also better how we can design better treatments so that we can properly look after these conditions. And as to whether microclots are involved in both, again, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say whether it's one or the other or a bit of both. I think there's an awful lot of overlap in all the different things that are happening in, in long COVID. OK, uh, anyone else, Steve? Stevie G? No? OK, um, let's go on to the next question then. Liz Baker, um, what are long COVID rates with Omicron? as far as is known five months in. Deepti gave us some feedback on that, so I'll come to her in a minute. Is it proportionally greater or less than earlier variants? And um, do we understand anything about who is more susceptible? Deepti. Yeah, so once again, I'm gonna try and separate out the, the incidence rates from the absolute impact. So, um, I mean, compared to the huge levels of infection that we've had in just the last three months, potentially the increases in long COVID are not proportional to the huge increase. The increases in absolute terms are very large in all age groups, including in highly vaccinated age groups. Whether that is because people are more vaccinated or whether Omicron is associated with the lower incidence of long COVID if infected, I don't know. But because your probability of getting infected absolutely is so much higher with Omicron, your overall risk of developing long COVID is still very high. And I, I think, you know, understanding the difference between that conditional incidence, which is if you get infected versus the absolute risk in a population, because your risk of being infected is high is vitally important because we are seeing huge increases during the Omicron wave. And that's before the impact of the whole Omicron wave has actually been felt. 
Thanks, DT. Uh, Danny. Yeah, just a little quick word about that. I just feel that during COVID times, every time the experts have tried to make predictions, COVID has done something ghastly to prove us wrong. And that's kind of true again. So if you'd asked me, I'd probably have guessed that if you had a triple, a, a largely triple vaccinated population and a so-called milder variant in Omicron, long COVID might perhaps be a thing of the past. We might not have any new cases. But you know, it's, it's as Dipti said, that with this onslaught of enormous caseload, um, and only looking at breakthrough infections in a vaccinated population. Um, we've got less long COVID than we might have had, but we've got a vast number of new cases. It's really vast. So it's, you know, it's, it's bad news. OK, thanks very much. The next question I'm particularly interested in. Um, I've had long COVID symptoms for 10 months after being infected, not severely, and uh, I was double vaccinated. But, you know, I get fatigue, I get uh, loss of taste and smell, I get neurological, you know, changes in sensation and stuff. Um, and I was a bit depressed when I saw Dipti because she presented that figure which showed that the longer you have it, the longer it's going to last. But the next question is actually more important than that. It's from Sophie Weldon. And she says, how likely is it that long COVID is a progressive disease? She says, I've had long COVID since I got COVID in March 2020, and I'm now bed bound for 20 hours out of 24. It seems to have got worse with each relapse. My baseline keeps getting lower and lower. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, who would like, I've got maybe Helen, Danny, or Aris might have something to say about that. Helen, should we kick off with you? I honestly think we don't know. Um, I think this is such uncharted territory. Most people with similar things in the past, so with um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, that things which have many features in common, most people do get better over time, mm. which, is, which is really encouraging. And sometimes over a very long time, but most people do improve in the end. However, this is, there's something different about COVID in that people are getting repeated infections. And I don't know how that alters what we should expect. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I'm yeah, it, it's awful that some people have been, are, are so ill like this, but I think it, it's such an unknown territory. I would, I, I don't think I can predict, except that we hope that people will eventually improve. Sorry, that's not much use to anyone. No, that's that's helpful. I mean, this is a relapsing condition because there are times where you feel better and then you you have a week or two when it's really much worse. But are the relapses getting worse? Is there any immunological basis or virological reason why we might see a deterioration over time rather than an improvement? Danny or Aris? Danny, you're on mute, Danny. Let's try Benita first, then I, I wouldn't mind saying something I'm sorry, Benita. Yeah. Hey, that's all right. Um, I think it, it, it's a really interesting question. And, and, and like um, Helen says, we don't have the answers. But when you st we're starting to understand more about the mechanisms of long COVID, so we there's more and more research now around persistent virus in tissues. Um, we're seeing that, you know, 200, 300, 400, I think the most recent 500 days post-infection. And what impact does that have? We know that the virus might induce autoimmunity, and that may be an ongoing reason why people are having these relapses a little bit like any other autoimmune condition. There's recent um, evidence around EBV uh, as a cause of MS, which is a very classic condition which can relapse, remit or progress. Uh, and then there's all the clotting abnormalities as well. So I think until we really get under the biomedical and physiological causes of what's causing the long COVID, we're going to struggle to really uh, be able to prognosticate. However, what we do know from the MECFS community is that that resting and pacing for that group of patients who are severely fatigued and get what we call post-exertional malaise, they get worse after exertion, that actually resting and pacing in that initial um, you know, one year, if that's how long your symptoms are, is really important to not get worse and deteriorate. Thanks, Benita. Danny or Aris? Danny. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say one sentence. I think, um, you know, we all admit we're in uncharted territory. I think persistent is a scary word that we don't need yet. 
and relapsing and remitting is scary enough. Um, and there's no particular evidence for um, for, um, progress, for progressive disease. Um, for my part, you know, we're, we're all trying to crystal ball gaze. One of the things I've been doing is contacting people who treated the SARS-CoV-1, um, you know, 2003 patients who got persistent symptoms and asking them how long they went on for and therefore what the future holds. If you speak to people in Canada, they were still seeing um, people with symptoms many, many years out. Um, if you speak to people in Hong Kong, um, less so. So I don't know if that's an ascertainment difference or a geographical difference or what. But, um, but the, yeah, there, there is some kind of end in sight somewhere. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Aris, no? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to add a, hu a huge amount of insight because um, effectively we don't know what the underlying mechanistic basis for, for, for the disease is. And there may be multiple underlying mechanistic bases. And, and given, given how long it's taken us, for example, to understand the role of, of EBV in, in, in MS, uh, I'm very much hoping that um, we're going to have treatments and establish treatments that, that, that help patients well before we have an understanding of the mechanistic basis uh, because that that may well take quite a long time, and, and hopefully we'll be able to to help patients before we get to the, to that point. Thanks. I mean, for for lay people, EBV is Epstein Barr virus, and uh, the the one that causes glandular fever. And uh, recently, a paper has shown that people who've had this infection are about thirty or forty times more likely to get MS, and that's a a fairly surprising uh, finding that you know has been not discovered for a long period. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Now, this is a more optimistic one. Could you give a view on anecdotal reports that the antiviral drug Paxlovid, uh, a treatment for a new COVID infection, actually, if you take this, will reduce existing long COVID symptoms? Can I go on a drug? Uh, who should we come to? Uh, Steve G to kick off. Um. Well, I think the issue here is, again, as we've been hearing, we don't really understand the etiology of long COVID, and it's almost certainly mixed. However, there is growing evidence, as we've heard from everyone here, that there is evidence that, that the virus can persist, maybe not in the same way that a, an acute infection presents, but certainly we, there's lots of precedents for RNA viruses persisting in different tissues. We know that people can shed the virus from their gut, for example. And, and as Sheena said, there are different immune signatures that might be related to persistent virus infection, perhaps not in cells that we might expect as well. So you would argue, therefore, that an antiviral could suppress that long running infection well enough for your immune system to finally do its job and finally mop it up. I think the problem is, though, that this is very much anecdotal. The vast majority of people don't have access to that sort of treatment at that stage of their disease. And of course, you know, we, we really would need to run trials on this to, to establish that. And, and I think we'd have to be really careful with our patients as well, because it's all a mixed bag. So, of course, it's hopeful. I would love to see a trial run on this. I think it's a really important question. What I wouldn't want people to do is to start taking this drug long term on its own as a therapy in the same way that some people have sort of got hold of and some proposed drugs that treat this virus in the past and taking them off label, that would be a mistake. We don't want to see resistance growing to this drug, um, but I think a trial should be definitely on the cards, hopefully forthcoming soon. Anita, do you know of any trials that are ongoing? Have you heard of any on the Great Fund? No, not in Paxlovid. I, I know personally some people who've, who've had Paxlovid after reinfection with long COVID and there does seem to be an improvement, but it's whether it's sustained or not, there doesn't seem to be a sustainability to that so as Stephen says we just absolutely need the trials uh, and I think there's an urgent need for the trials lovely okay thank you that's good let, let me um I've got two more questions which are which will take so one is many long COVID sufferers are losing their jobs homes ability to live independently I mean I'm comfortably off I work part-time I work from home so my symptoms don't they're not a great social disability but for many people, it's a nightmare. You know, if I was Steve's age or Dipti's age or, you know, if I was a student or somebody, you know, in a frontline job, it would be a nightmare. I would hate to be doing that right now. I couldn't do it. 
So this is a big issue. What can be done to support people overall? Let's go to Paula first. If she, is Paula still with us? Yeah. What, what I can am. We do? What can we do about this to help people? I guess we can just, um, well, so I guess my role is to produce the evidence to show that. But I, I do fear um, that where some of the evidence is being generated is from captured patients and there's a whole vast array of people who aren't getting care and they're not in the system yet and they may be people who are young um people who are out of work you know there's a wait um so there is a worry that we're not we're not hearing that voice and then it's about i guess determining whether treasury is um can work out you know some sort of I don't know, unemployment, long-term sick leave approach to this to make sure that people are, are not, you know, economically disadvantaged from, from the pandemic. They, they ensured um, a lot of people weren't economically disadvantaged during the pandemic with a lot of packages. Um, and so perhaps they need to turn their hand at that um, to think about the, the long COVID as a consequence of the pandemic and, and address the economic disadvantage in the same way with addressing some of the unemployment policies and sick leave policies. Thank yeah. you. Quick quick input from Zubeda and Steve Reicher. And then I want to go to the final question. So keep it fairly punchy. Well, I was going to say the one thing that's been continuously ignored in this pandemic is the fact that this is a pandemic of inequality. We've seen that in terms of exposure. We've seen that in terms of hospitalizations. We've seen that in terms of deaths. And we've seen that in terms of vaccine uptake. And the government know that and they've repeatedly ignored that. Now, when it comes to long COVID, we've got even more serious concerns because right now it's very difficult for people to log their lateral flow tests with the system, very difficult to demonstrate that they've had COVID because it depends on what kind, where you get your lateral flow test from. And it's also very difficult to upload it onto the system and so on. So I think it's extremely concerning. We've seen that it has huge ramifications in terms of employment. And we know that employers themselves are saying that up to about a quarter of their staff are struggling with long COVID. And I don't know what this government's plan is because right now it just feels like it's just <laughs> putting its head in the sand. So there are really worrying issues right now with this government's approach to the pandemic and to long COVID. Steve. So you, you mentioned um, students, Anthony, and that makes the obvious point that long COVID doesn't have to last that long to have lifelong consequences. If it lasts yeah. long enough to impair your performance on examinations, it will infect you for the rest of your life. And one set of institutions which many of us are involved in, um, in other words, schools and universities, should be doing something. They should be monitoring students. They should be seeing if their performance is being affected. They should therefore being taken, uh, be taking that into account because I think that's really important. And the examination boards equally should be uh, considering procedures. Now, part of that, of course, Zubeda is right. You need to know that you've had COVID to know that you've had long COVID and therefore the question of logging is really important. And somebody made the really useful point that, you know, if you test positive, take a photograph of uh, the test with the QR code and with the positive, which gives you some evidence. But as I say, there is also something that institutions, educational institutions can and must be doing in order to make sure we take uh, the possibility of long COVID into account when we look at students' academic performance. Thank you. And, and Deepti pointed out the very high you know, rates in, in younger children. And of course, they're not vaccinated, most of them. And that's, a, a, in my view, a potential disaster because, uh, you know, we, we think the studies have shown that vaccination probably halves the rate of long COVID. And if our kids are not vaccinated. But anyway, that's another issue. I want to go to the last question. We're slightly overrun. Adam Stockford, he said, Dr. Strain, who is part of the UK Long COVID Task Force, has previously said that a proportion of people with long COVID have a disease that looks identical to ME chronic fatigue syndrome. This suggests that ME chronic fatigue syndrome is incredibly important, but from what I read, it often seems to be left out of the conversation. Why do you think this is? And what research is currently looking into if a subset of long COVID is the same as ME chronic fatigue syndrome? So I'll come to Benita first, and then anyone else that wants to comment further. Benita. 
Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, there is a long history of how people with ME-CFS have kind of battled to be heard and understood and researched and treated. And it's an illness that has devastated uh, millions of lives across the world. So I think it's really important to acknowledge the suffering of the ME-CFS community. Um, you know, there are without doubt overlaps with uh, long COVID, both clinically and in research. So for example, my daughter who's 11, she's got a diagnosis of long COVID and ME-CFS. And I've learned an awful lot from the ME-CFS community that I wasn't taught as a healthcare professional. So I think there is a culture change um, and I think it's not mentioned because it's often not on the radar of, of healthcare professionals, whereas long COVID very much is now. Um, I think the positive here is that I am sure that long COVID research is going to open up uh, diagnostic and treatment options for those with ME. And I know there is work going on both in the States, uh, in South Africa, looking at ME-CFS, um, as well as long COVID for things like microclots and platelet hyperbaric activation and there are some research promising looking research trials so there's the bc uh, 007 which is a drug um, which neutralizes autoantibodies um, that's been found to be quite effective in, in in a small number of patients with long covid so there's a lot of interest in that for mecfs um, and there is also a trial in oxford looking at a drug that looks at mitochondrial function um, and is aiming to reduce severe fatigue in long COVID. And again, a potential promising treatment for MECFS. I'm really hoping that this brings some good news to the millions of sufferers across the world. Thanks very much, Benita. That's an optimistic note to end on because I think they have been left out in many ways of, of, of the research uh, investment over the past years. And, and, and I hope, and you know, we've heard about chikungunya and, uh, and, and other things. Did you have a comment, Dipti? Yes, <laughs> I don't want to take away from the optimistic note, but I, I just want to say one of the frustrating things about long COVID and ME and CFS has been lack of acceptance of the underlying biology being complex yeah. and biological. <laughs> and a lot of the NIHR funding on treatments, and you know, a lot of us try to apply for these was on things like rehabilitative treatments, mental health treatments, graded exercise therapy, and um, nutritional therapies for a disease that is very likely complex in origin with possibly autoimmune causes virus persistence microclotting and i think unless we start treating this as a biological disease and seriously doing trials for a biological disease you know opening long covid clinics is not enough and i worry if uk is at the forefront of this because i feel like we are personally very 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 behind Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge to UKRI, the Medical Research Council and Wellcome Trust to really invest in this because this is a massive issue uh, and, it, it, and it extends beyond the coronavirus. I mean, it's, it's, it's got all kinds of things. I hope they will step up to the plate. That's all we have time for. Thanks so much to Paul and Andre for their contributions. Thanks for the great questions. Really excellent. Um, and we're welcoming our new members who I hope we're going to hear much more from. Next week, we've got a session, uh, I hope, on, on new variants and uh, what that means and what might emerge in future. That's going to be extremely interesting as well. But we need to wrap up now. We'll see you all next week. Uh, same time, same place. Stay safe. Keep well. Thanks very much.